Hi everyone, it's noon, so I think we'll get going. Um, I'm Dr. Sarah Jandrisic. I'm the Greenhouse Floriculture IPM Specialist with OMAFRA, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And this is part of our Greater Greenhouse Team uh, Controlled Environment Agriculture Series, a webinar series that we've been putting on. Um, my co-host today is Dr. Siobhan Dayball. She's the Greenhouse Floriculture Production Specialist. Um, just a few housekeeping things before I introduce Neil, our speaker today. Um, if you have questions that you want to ask throughout the talk, we're going to field them at the end of the talk, but please enter them as you go in the Q&A function at the bottom of Zoom, which is going to look like the two uh, speaking boxes. Um, if you're having technical difficulties uh, or uh, just want to make comments like, that's great, uh, then use the chat function, which is the single word bubble. Um, we're recording the session today, so if you need to leave for whatever reason, it will be available online after this. Um, and now I, I'll get on with introducing Neil. So I had the pleasure of working with Neil when I was a grad student at Cornell University. Uh, as a bug person, he helped me figure out what different plant parts were called. When I was trying to do an experiment of figuring out where foxglove aphid likes to feed on plants, I realized I had no idea what different flowers and flower structures <laughs> were called. So Neil helped me out with that. Um, Neil's a, a professor of extension with the Cornell, as I said, and the director of the Controlled Environment Agriculture um, Research Center. So he specializes in anything to do with optimizing greenhouse plants, whether that's vegetables or floriculture, sp with specific interest in things like lighting, uh, reducing energy usage, and also fertilizers. So I'm sure he's going to be touching on each of those today, and I'm sure you'll have lots of great questions for Neil at the end. So with that, I'm going to leave it to Neil and uh, take it away. Thank you. Thanks for the very kind introduction. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here today. And I will get to talk about all of my pet topics. So we're going to talk about a bunch of strategies to improve crop shelf life. Um, we'll talk about strategies that you can do during the production stage. Um, I'm going to do a sidebar to talk about a couple novel tools that I've done some research in, silicon and seaweed extract. And then we'll talk about tips that you can carry with you into retail. Um, so in the consumer environment, things that we can do to extend the shelf life of our plants. Uh, and uh, why try to extend retail shelf life? I guess in my mind, that's a pretty easy question, right? We don't want to waste uh, plants and have to throw them out. Um, because they didn't sell or because their quality deteriorated over time. Um, and unfortunately, we do have to do this from time to time. When we have to toss our plants, we end up with compost piles or dumpsters full of unsold product. Um, another name for that in the retail industry is shrinkage or crop losses. Um, so we want to de decrease crop losses to improve our, our bottom line. Um, this is just a simplistic example that I put together, um, but let's assume that we're growing a thousand containers of something um, and uh, we sell them for three dollars each. Uh, and so if we have zero percent shrink um, and our cost to produce each of these thousand plants is two dollars and fifty cents, our gross revenue um, is three thousand dollars, our net revenue is five hundred, and we actually earned a profit with that crop. Um, if we invested the same amount of labor and inputs um, into growing a thousand plants, but we only have 900 coming out of them, then the cost to produce each sold container goes down. In this case, $2.78, and our profit goes down to 7.5%. And if we get to 20% shrink in this scenario, we still had those same input costs, but we could only sell 800 uh, plants to recover that. And so our profits are actually negative. So we actually paid for the pleasure of working hard to grow that crop just to lose money. So obviously we want to reduce shrinkage um, and shrinkage can happen at different stages. Um, I like this, this was a survey done by Ball Floral back in 2008 where they surveyed a bunch of young plant growers, um, kind of wholesale finishers of uh, bedding plants and flowering potted plants and then retailers and consumers. Um, and they um, came up with kind of average shrinkage percentages um, across those different stages. So at the young plant stage, the thought was um, there were 20% losses uh, for seedlings, 17% for liners. 
um, 12 to 13 percent losses at the finishing stage, another 11 to 14 percent at the retail stage. And then this one makes me even sadder at the consumer stage. So the consumer bought the plant and brought it home, um, but 10 percent of those plants or so didn't survive to get into their garden or get used in their container. Um, and so the question is, where does it hurt the most? Um, in terms of our profitability, the later we get in that stage, um, the more inputs and labor we put into that crop um, and the more expensive crop losses are going to be. So crop losses at retail are more expensive losses than, than losses at the young plant stage where, where we haven't put much time into that crop and the crops at a high density. So we're gonna talk about strategies to reduce the shrinkage. So what are some of the reasons that we have retail plant losses? And there are many, right? And some of these are in our control, but many of these are not under our control. Um, so uh, market date not achieved, that could be something that is due to a scheduling issue or a mismanagement issue, um, but maybe improper care at retail. If we're wholesale growers, that's not under our control. Um, so plants can get past their prime. We could have overproduced and tried to predict the market, uh, bad weather. Maybe our plants weren't hardened off, so they, they died easily once they made it to the retail environment. Um, or we had poor plant quality from things that we could have um, uh, handled when we were producing that plant. So ultimately, this, this can lead to plants that didn't sell. So good retail shelf life really begins during the greenhouse production stage. Um, and we'll talk about some common sense strategies and some environmental control strategies. Some of the common sense strategies are not to build in buffer time to your production schedule. Um, make sure to space your plants appropriately. I've got a great picture on that. Um, try to make sure that your crop has at least sufficient light. Um, so we often like to add hanging baskets to our growing environment. We think of it as kind of free space, uh, but the one thing that those hanging baskets are doing is they're taking light away from the lower crop. So fertilizing appropriately, not too much or not too little. Uh, and then we'll talk about toning plants before shipping too and kind of hardening them off and getting them ready to um, withstand shipping and retail. So spacing is a really important common sense strategy. Uh, we want to um, avoid excess of elongation and damage that can occur. Um, and so essentially like our, our, our plants, um, uh, as they perceive light, if we have leaves from a neighboring plant growing into the leaves of another neighbor plant, um, the, the plant is going to pick up that it's being shaded. Um, and for the plant that triggers a shade avoidance response, which it wants to grow taller than its neighbor, and reach a light source. So we're gonna have elongated stems. Um, we also might have kind of leaves of one plant growing into the other one so that when we pull the plants to ship them, um, we have um, breakage. So, so ideally we, we would have either given these plants more space or we would have um, identified that we needed to use plant growth regulators or some other um, cultural practice to keep down the size of the plant so that they didn't grow out of the space that they were allotted. Uh, fertility is very important and I won't um, go into that in too much detail. Um, th this is an example of a terrenia that was grown at 50 parts per million nitrogen with a, with a complete liquid fertilizer on the left and a plant that was grown at 150 parts per million nitrogen with a complete fertilizer. Um, and obviously that's going to affect the plant uh, quality. Um, so the plant under kind of sufficient fertility um, is going to last longer post-harvest. It's also gonna be a much more marketable plant. So the consumers are gonna pick that up and buy it. Uh, and then it'll be out of our hands. So then as I mentioned, excessive shading um, promotes excessive elongation, which we also think about in terms of hanging baskets that, that we have in our greenhouse. So typically the thought would be, that we would only put hanging baskets above the like walkways in our greenhouse um, and not uh, putting hanging baskets directly above um, the benches. Um, there might be specialized cases where we do that if we know that we have low light crops underneath like ferns or foliage plants or something like that. <clears throat> 
So uh, when we have low light conditions, here's another example of that um, elongation that's taking place. So this poor petunia hanging basket is not going to be particularly marketable at this point. Here's an example of a crop that was just held for too long. Um, ideally, it's a crop that would have been able to be shipped out maybe two or three weeks earlier. Um, and if it had been shipped according to, to that timeline, um, we would have not had any quality control issues. Uh, but maybe plants weren't selling fast enough at retail, and so the retailers weren't asking for new plants yet. Um, and unfortunately, this, this crop was held too long. So we can go back and look at, was that um, an issue with management? Should we have shortened the crop cycle? Um, or should we have slowed down um, the crop once we realized that we were going to have to hold it for two or three extra weeks? And I always like to say not to build in buffer time into your crop schedule. So if we, if we go through the crop scheduling process and um, we see realistically that it takes X number of weeks to go from transplant to harvest, um, if you add in extra time to that, thinking that, oh, it'll help you in case something goes wrong, what will happen is you'll just have overgrown plants by, by the time that it comes to ship them. So if we could have realized that this crop was, was going to be sitting around for two to three extra weeks, that would be a good time to look at cultural control practices, which I'll talk about lowering the temperature, for example, um, as much as possible. Um, or using plant growth regulators to, um, to control growth of that plant until they get shipped out to retail. So um, some tips for toning plants before retail. Um, and what I really mean by toning is um, during greenhouse production, we might be trying to push our plants to grow as fast as possible. Um, however, um, the the shape of the plant, the, the, um, the epidermis or the, the outer surface of the plant can take on kind of this, this lush, fast growing, um, sensitive type plant material that is easier to be physically damaged during shipping or retail. Um, so typically for the last uh, two to three weeks of production, we want to kind of slow down growth of the plant. Um, and so the plant can kind of toughen up before uh, we have to ship it out. So uh, some of the tools that we have are cultural, so growing the plant lean, so, so a bit low on fertility, but not too low, um, growing it dry, not giving the plant the full moisture that it would take, or growing it cool to slow the plant down. Um, we can also use plant growth regulators, um, and in particular, so we can use plant growth regulators, of course, to contain the height of the plant. Uh, also, it's been found that a couple of our plant growth regulators increase the chlorophyll content and they give us greener leaves. Um, and those leaves also, because they have more chlorophyll, accumulate higher carbohydrates. So those, those plants um, have kind of storage reserves to survive some days in shipping or days in retail where they're not getting maybe full light. Um, so psychocell or the active ingredient is chlormaquat, chlormaquat chloride or paclobutrazole. An example of that is bonsai, are two of these PGRs that, that we know increase the, the leaf chlorophyll content. Um, so regarding fertilization, um, we might want to cut the fertilizer rate by half in the last two weeks to um, produce that slightly more compact toned uh, plant. We don't want to completely cut off fertilizer because we don't want the plant to become nutrient deficient um, in the retail environment. Um, and then we can also use cooler temperatures as a way to um, tone our plants. Um, one of these tools that we have is decreasing the night temperatures for the final two to three weeks of production. And I'll show you a list here in a second. We have um, many of our bedding plants are fairly cold tolerant and they would have no issues um, at night temperatures of 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. We do have some more tender plants um, and for those we would aim for, ooh, and I'll show you in degrees Celsius in a second, 58 to 62 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then we do have a few heat loving plants like impatience that do not benefit from these cooler night temperatures. Um, so here's a grower. This was a, a grower in, in New York on Lake Ontario that's actually finishing their, their petunia plants outdoors to keep them um, toned. You can see they're very nice and compact. They're starting to flower. 
um, they, um, they're being grown pot to pot, so they don't want them to grow excessively into their neighbors. Um, and so this outdoor growing is working quite well for them. It also freed up space in their greenhouse um, so that they could maybe grow their more cold sensitive plants in the greenhouse. Um, one thing that you'll notice is this growers, uh, these plants were moved out um, when there's still a slight chance of frost. And so they actually have row cover fabric um, that they, they use to cover their plants at night if the night temperatures are gonna get cold. Uh, so I promised that I would show you those, um, those night temperature groups. Um, so our more cold tolerant plants would be this, this first group um, with 10 to 13 degrees Celsius. And many of our common bedding plants are in, are in this group. So ageratum, calendula, dianthus, marigold, pansies, um, all types of herbaceous perennials, uh, petunias, salvia, snapdragons, um, terrenia. Um, and then we have our crops that are, that are somewhat more cold sensitive. So things like begonia and celosia and coleus uh, and so on, we want to keep at 14 to 17 degrees Celsius for their, their night temperature. Um, so we don't want to, to have them too cold. Um, one of the things to point out is that if we are using these cooler temperatures, um, it will affect their rate of development. So it does slow down developmental processes. So if we're trying to get our, our plant to unfold a certain number of leaves or flower at shipping, it's going to slow down its progress toward that. Um, and so um, what this graph shows us is we have temperature on the x-axis or that horizontal axis from being cold conditions to, to warm conditions. And then um, the y-axis is the development rate of the plant. So we could think of different developmental processes like leaf unfolding rate um, or um, progress toward flowering, for example. So we have our cold tolerant plants have, they're cold tolerant, they have a lower base temperature. The base temperature is the, below that temperature, the plant may not be dying or freezing, um, but it's not making progress toward development. And above that base temperature, for every degree warmer the temperature is, we make additional progress in terms of the developmental rate. Um, and then that increases up to an optimum. Um, and really what's important here is average daily temperature. So not just, not just day temperature or night temperature, but the average temperature um, for the 24 hour period of time. So we get to an optimal temperature. And then if we go above that optimal temperature, development rate can slow down. Um, for our cold sensitive plants, we have a similar shape, um, but these plants have a warmer base temperature requirement and they might actually be like chilling sensitive, for example. So like basil at less than 10 degrees Celsius is gonna show um, leaf damage from chilling injury. Um, and then if we get above this base temperature, um, again, we uh, make progress toward our developmental rate. Um, and then these cold sensitive crops have a warmer optimal temperature than cold tolerant crops. Um, uh, some years ago now, I did an experiment um, at Cornell, Cornell University. Um, and we also did this in conjunction with, with Purdue University in Indiana, where we finished different bedding plants in unheated high tunnels, and we compared that to a greenhouse. Um, and we found that uh, the high tunnel environment averaged, so we would, these were things that we transplanted them, we moved them to a high tunnel um, around April uh, 10th or so. Um, it should be climate dependent, right? If you have a colder climate, wait until later in the spring. And we had counterparts that were transplanted and kept in a heated greenhouse. So our high tunnel temperature averaged 15 degrees Celsius for the, the five to six week finishing period. The greenhouse averaged 19 degrees Celsius um, versus outside it was an average of nine degrees. Then our daily light integral, I thought this was quite interesting. So our high tunnel was this, this simple uh, plastic covered hoop house. Um, and it actually let in a lot more light than our glass covered greenhouse with a lot of structure that was on campus. So our daily light integral in moles per meter squared per day, which is the total amount of sunlight that we got uh, for the plant um, was much higher in the high tunnel than in the greenhouse. Um, and so that's going to improve plant quality in terms of the energy that it has to um, grow more branches and leaves and, th and then ultimately flowers. Um, and also that improves 
quality characteristics as well. So ultimately, I'll show you, I'll show you a few pictures. Um, these, and we didn't use plant growth regulators in this experiment because we wanted to see what the, the plants would do themselves. So we have um, Petunia um, Midnight, uh, Dreams Midnight, I believe, uh, that was grown under a high tunnel. Those are the two plants on the left, either with controlled release fertilizer or water soluble fertilizer. And you can see they're much more toned and compact, um, a little bit maybe delayed in their flowering, but a very nice, well-branched plant that's going to have lots of flower buds. And we compare that with its greenhouse counterparts, um, which maybe develop more quickly, but they also were excessively elongated. Here's an example from hanging baskets that we had in the high tunnel versus the greenhouse. Um, this was petunia silk and satin. Um, and the, the high tunnel grown petunias were much more compact. We still had a very large um, flower number, so it'd be a very marketable high tunnel. And you can imagine if a consumer wanted it'll be easier to ship the, the uh, basket on the left, um, but also it should last longer in retail um, and probably be successful for the consumer longer um, than this kind of overgrown um, greenhouse plant on the right. So um, I mentioned that, that we were pleased to see in the high tunnel that there were higher daily light integrals, so higher amounts of light. Um, we know that uh, quality characteristics such as the flower size um, depend on temperature and daily light integral. So while a, a plant might flower earlier under warm temperatures, um, flower size tends to be bigger under cooler temperatures. So in the top row, uh, 14 degrees Celsius flower is going to be bigger and wider than uh, a flower from a plant grown under 26 degrees Celsius. Um, and then similarly, uh, having that higher daily light integral also gives us more carbohydrate resources that the plant can direct toward its flowers. And so we have bigger flower size under that combination of, of cooler temperatures and higher daily light integral. So as much as we can do to improve the quality of the plant that way, um, we'll give our, our consumers uh, more success. Um, and, gen and in general characteristics of plants that are grown under higher light levels, um, they will be like the plant on the left or versus plants that are grown under lower light levels will be like the plant on the right. So they're gonna have smaller, thicker leaves uh, if they have more light, more and larger flowers, faster flowering, increased branching, um, increased stem diameter. So you can have a, a tougher plant, um, not as likely for the, the stem to snap um, and then increased root growth as well. Um, and I had to share this slide. This was some recent work from my PhD student, um, Zhao Qi. Uh, and um, in this case, we were looking at uh, lighting petunias at the liner stage, but it demonstrates some of the same principles. So these were three uh, petunia varieties that um, during um, three weeks during their, their liner production stage, um, we grew them under um, increasing light level. So from six moles of light on the left side, all the way up to 15 moles per meter squared per day on the right side. Um, we were also testing a hypothesis about far red light. So far red light um, triggers plants to grow taller, but it can also trigger plants to flower earlier as well. And we were trying to see if that would give us any practical benefit for um, petunias. And um, what we found overall is that with higher daily light integral during liner production, we saw increased root growth, um, increased flower bud formation, um, and uh, decreased days to flowering. We didn't see a far red effect on flowering under the conditions of our experiment. The only thing that we did see is under low light intensity, we saw even more stretched plants when they had uh, far red light versus their control counterparts. Um, so then we, we transplanted these liners and finished them in the same growing environment. Um, and we wanted to see if there were carryover effects of supplemental lighting during the liner stage um, on their final plant size and quality. Um, overall, we found that the um, nine moles per meter squared per day daily light integral or higher was required um, at the liner stage to get good finished plant quality. Um, and then if we had 15 moles of light, we had kind of optimum quality in terms of the biomass of the plant, the fresh weight and the dry weight, um, branching and flowering, um, 
so the bud number. Um, and we didn't see a particular carryover effect of far red light. So it didn't seem like far red was a beneficial tool in this case for getting um, petunias to flower earlier, um, but also have high quality at the same time. Um, then I wanna take a, a short sidebar on a, a couple um, products that I'm excited about that might be a potential tool in your toolkit in terms of increasing um, plant shelf life. Um, one of these is um, silicon. Silicon is, is one of the elements that's on the periodic table of elements. Um, it is the second largest constituent of soil um, behind oxygen. So soil particles are 27% silicon. Um, and silicon's not thought of as necessarily an essential nutrient for plants like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. Um, but it turns out that that plants do take up silicon. They take it up in the form of orthosilicic acid, which is this chemical structure here, um, one silicon atom with uh, four oxygens and four hydrogens. Um, and so many plants do take up silicon and it can actually be a beneficial um, nutrient, which I'll point out some of the, especially for stress responses of the plant. Um, a lot of times soils, and in some cases tap water has sufficient silicon for plants, um, but if we're growing our plants in a soilless media, like a peat or coconut core based media with, with perlite or vermiculite, um, those uh, substrates are not high in silicon. Um, so we've actually done studies where we've looked at adding silicon into our fertilizer program. Um, and uh, typically commercially, uh, the silicon products, we purchase them as either potassium or calcium silicates. Um, and unfortunately, one thing about these silicates is that they can precipitate if they're uh, mixed in the same concentrated stock tank as other standard fertilizers. Um, and so we need another injector that's in series if, we're, if we have a stock tank that we want to add potassium or calcium silicate to. Um, and this is just kind of the jar test below where I found at the dilute concentration that the plants would get at 100 or 200 parts per million nitrogen with the appropriate amount of potassium silicate, there was not precipitation, but in a, in, uh, considering like a one to 100 injector, uh, mixing them up uh, at that concentrated amount, we do see precipitation or this sludge forming that's gonna be not soluble and it's gonna clog up our injector. So we either need an additional injector or you could consider a day of the week when you're not fertilizing um, and add potassium silicate um, at that point in time. Um, the suggested trial rate, and I do recommend doing trials at a very small scale, um, would be 50 to 50 parts per million silicon if you're doing this daily as part of a constant liquid feed program, um, or 100 parts per million silicon if you're doing a weekly drench. Um, and these silicates are slightly alkaline, so they do raise the pH slightly. So you may need to um, slightly adjust the amount of acid that you're adding to maintain um, pH. For example, we found over the course of a um, eight to 10 week experiment that the pH in our, in our substrate raised by about 0.3 units. Um, and then what are some of the results? Increasingly, we're finding that um, silicon in particular can improve um, plant health when they're exposed to some type of stress. So if we, if we have plants growing under optimum conditions, we often don't necessarily see a particular benefit of silicon. Um, there are some cases where, where folks have seen larger stem diameter, so a sturdier plant or um, greater rooting with silicon. But a lot of times the observable effects that we see with silicon are primarily when we stress the plant. Um, and here's an example with the poinsettias where the way that we stress them is by um, not watering them in post-harvest, uh, which seems silly, right? But we've all been to these big box stores where they don't um, water the, the flowering potted plants that they get in. Um, and if it doesn't sell in the first week or so, it's gonna get dumped, unfortunately. Um, so we have a plant that was treated with silicon on the left. It got the um, constant liquid feed at 50 parts per million silicon during its production stage. And the plant on the right um, was the non-silicon control. Um, and these plants wilted three to four days earlier than our silicon treated plants. Um, the plants with silicon also recovered um, better from wilt after rewatering them. 
So plants wilted uh, on the top, and then um, we rewatered them um, when they had reached wilting, um, and the plants with silicon recovered. We've actually found um, for petunias, um, we did a heat stress experiment, and we found um, that silicon treated plants were more tolerant of heat stress. Um, so these were petunias. Um, this was an experiment where we didn't have two injectors. So we actually uh, once a week did the 100 parts per million potassium silicate drenches. Those are the plants on the right, the plus silicon treated plants. Um, and then the plants, uh, the control plants without silicon are on the left. And then we did this funny thing where we grew them at 40 degrees Celsius for three days um, to see how they would respond to heat stress. Um, and we kept watering them during that time. So this was not a drought stress response, um, but our plants, um, our control plants collapsed and were starting to turn yellow and flowers were closing at those warm temperatures when they didn't have silicon. Um, one of the things uh, that we found um, from a, I think this was interesting more just from a like plant physiology standpoint, is that stressed petunia plants actually took up um, more silicon. Um, and so it's kind of like the plant has the underlying machinery to take up additional silicon when it's stressed. Um, and so what this graph shows is the leaf silicon concentration in, in parts per million. Um, and then we had in this study, um, three different silicon treatments that we applied in the fertilizer. Our control was zero parts per million. Um, then we had our kind of low silicon treatment, which was 28 parts per million. And then our high um, treatment, which was 56 parts per million. And so the, the gray bars were before a heat stress event um, and how much silicon was in the leaf. And then the black is after a heat stress event um, where we find that the, the plants actually accumulated um, more silicon in their leaf. So, so we call that SISU, stress-induced silicon uptake. And this is my one personal ploy. Um, if any of you are familiar with um, Finland, they have this expression called SISU, which they say can't directly be translated to English, but it means um, stubbornness and resilience and independence. Basically, all of those things that help you cope with stressful conditions. Um, as kind of an inherent personality trait that one can strive for. So we're finding that silicon has some of these same, same um, stress-induced silicon effects. Um, there is, with this growing realization that silicon can be a beneficial element, um, we're finding more products on the market for applying silicon. So, so I mentioned the, the liquid applied forms, the potassium and calcium silicates. Um, there are also some substrate applied forms, um, and in particular, SunGrow has a line of their Promix substrates, which um, you can get with a slow release um, silicon source. Um, so those are called their resilience line of um, silicon based substrates. Um, overall, if I were to think about uh, whether you would consider silicon or not, um, we do find that um, the addition of silicon to greenhouse plants um, growing in soilless substrate. So if there's uh, not soil, um, appears to be beneficial for certain plants under certain conditions. It doesn't appear to be a cure-all. It could be an interesting kind of insurance policy to test at a small scale first to see if you can see um, specific crop benefits for you. Um, and in particular, we see the most opportunity for benefit if there is a stress present. Um, if the tap water or fertilizer or substrate doesn't already supply silicon. Um, and like I said, it's not a miracle cure for every stress. The other kind of interesting um, product that we've tested at Cornell that I wanted to mention is seaweed extract. Um, so seaweed extracts or seaweed have been used as soil amendments and fertilizers in agriculture for centuries. Um, and seaweeds uh, type of plant, right? And, and it's a plant that contains many different substances of interest. So it can contain trace amounts of, of plant essential nutrients. Um, it does have some amino acids, vitamins, and then um, plant hormone um, type substances. Um, and um, there are commercial seaweed extracts um, on the market. Um, which they've made essentially like liquid forms of seaweed that are that are easy to apply to your plants. Um, we had an example where we tested um, the effect. We did this both with petunias and tomatoes, where we grew um, 
uh, these plants uh, with a particular seaweed extract. The one that we used was called um, Stimplex, which is actually a, a um, Canadian product from Newfoundland. Um, and this product was applied at uh, rates from zero to 20 milliliters per liter. Um, and we applied it at uh, as either a spray on the plant weekly um, or a drench to the root zone weekly. Um, and then we uh, imposed drought stress to the plant where I moved them to a post-harvest environment and we stopped watering them to see what would happen. One of the things that we found with the uh, drench treatment is that we actually saw an increase in the flower number per plant um, with, um, with drenches um, at, uh, at increasing concentration. Um, here's our um, plants um, at the beginning of drought stress. So these were petunia plants that either had a spray form of that seaweed extract from zero to 20 milliliters per liter. Um, and then they had um, a drench form from zero to 20 milliliters per liter. So you can see we did see increased um, flower number for the drench treatment. Um, and then um, we also saw with that drench treatment that they had um, increased um, drought tolerance. Um, so here was um, a, a different but related experiment where these plants were four and a half days into their drought stress. Um, and with the 10 milliliter per liter drench of seaweed extract, the plants took longer to, um, to wilt than our control plants. So, um, so those were a little bit of my sidebar conversational pieces related to silicon and seaweed. Um, let's move on um, and we'll spend the last few slides talking about things that we can do in the retail setting to improve our plant quality. So if we look at factors that decrease plant quality in the retail setting, um, many factors, right? So just wilting of the plant from not being cared for properly and given the water that it needs, excessive stem elongation from being held for too long, um, nutrient deficiencies, um, this photo in the middle is actually not a nutrient deficiency, but it's yellowing of lower leaves from low carbohydrates. So this plant was stored under dark conditions for too long. And so the plant started scavenging carbohydrates from the lower leaves. We can see premature leaf or flower drop. And then of course, insect and disease issues as well. So some of the things that we want to think through with plant care in the retail is again, temperature and light. So we, um, during the growing stage, we grew our plant to the perfect stage that we wanted it to be. During retail, we're trying to hold that plant in the perfect stage um, until the consumer can come and buy it. So we want to avoid high temperatures. Cooler is better um, uh, to maintain just the plant the way it is, and we don't necessarily want it to further develop at that stage. Um, one of the ways that we can control temperature is by uh, moderating the level of light too. So we want to keep the plants out of full sun because they can warm up too quickly and dry out too quickly. However, we also want to avoid excess shading. So if we're under very dark conditions, um, our plants aren't going to get the carbohydrates that they need to um, keep their leaves green. So we often kind of compromise and use about 50% shade. Um, and we also want to avoid holding plants on racks for an extended period of time. These were plants that I saw um, where you could envision that the, the plants facing the consumer are getting plenty of light, um, but the plants in the back half of the tray are getting too shaded and they're going to deteriorate more quickly. Um, some of those common sense in retail things are um, still thinking about insect and disease control, um, maintaining good air movement for disease prevention, removing spent flowers and debris so that we don't have an entry point for um, things like gray mold uh, to, to um, get established and spread to, to neighboring crops. Um, water is needed certainly, but, but um, ideally not overhead water, or if we do have to overhead water, make sure that our leaves and flowers are um, drying out before um, we reach overnight. Continue to monitor for pests and diseases. We may have more limited control options at that point, um, but we still want to be aware of what's going on. Um, and we can isolate plants, we could talk through um, biocontrols that we could use at retail, et cetera. Um, and then we do want to fertilize periodically. We don't want to excessively 
fertilize because we're not trying to get the plant to grow as quickly as possible. We're just trying to maintain the plant in the form that it's at. Um, so typically we'd recommend maybe a constant liquid feed on the, on the lower end of things, maybe 50 or at most 100 parts per million nitrogen. Um, or if you're fertilizing once per week, that might be at say 200 to 400 parts per million nitrogen, but just once per week. Um, or considering using a controlled release fertilizer. Maybe you don't have an injector in your retail area, so it's hard to add liquid feed. Then it's like, let's, let's see what we can do to add controlled release fertilizer, either before those plants come into retail um, or thinking back with a, a longer term slow release fertilizer that could be added at the back in the time of um, transplant if it has um, residual fertilizer that will continue to be released at retail. So continue to do those things like scouting, um, in terms of fertilization, ideally you would be able to add liquid fertilizer um, unless you've thought through using controlled release. So um, you can get portable injectors that you can cart around. Um, then we still need to have proper irrigation practices. So this pot on the right looks like someone, an employee just splashed water on the pot and it's gonna be drying out very quickly. Um, and uh, unfortunately it, it's gonna wilt very quickly too because we didn't thoroughly water that container. Um, and then overhead watering, of course, if we have to do this repeatedly over time, this could lead to, to spotting on the leaves in some cases. Um, fertilizers that you use during production might not necessarily be the same fertilizers to use in retail. Um, and in particular, um, we would consider using a fertilizer with low phosphorus um, during retail. So um, phosphorus, um, excess phosphorus can lead to excess plant stretch. So if we want to keep our plants toned and compact, we're going to uh, move to fertilizers that would have um, low phosphorus. All right, I think I've covered the material I want to cover. We'll go to questions in just a minute here. Um, I wanted to point out that I'm part of a team with several other um, uh, greenhouse crop researchers across the U.S. Um, where we have weekly updates on kind of interesting pest and disease and abiotic issues that we see throughout the spring. Um, and this is called the eGrow Alerts. Um, and we have all of our old bulletins um, on our website, which is e-grow.org. Um, you can go there and hit subscribe if you want to join the, the weekly um, newsletter that goes out. Um, and you can find other interesting training videos and things like that at egrow.org. So with that, I want to thank you and if we'll work together and hope for a good spring and we'll work to keep our plants alive with John Travolta helping us out here. Um, <laughs> I like how you had to mention trademarks for staying alive. <laughs> right, right, <Yeah>. yeah. <laughs> uh, that was all really great information, Neil. We really appreciate it. Um, I definitely can vouch for the eGrow newsletters that they're chocked full of good information that I rely on as an extension specialist as well. So I encourage everyone to look there and also just encouraging everyone to take the opportunity to ask questions of Neil in the Q&A function. I know Siobhan's got a couple of questions already. Yeah, I'm ready to uh, fire away if you're ready to take the questions, Neil. Okay, perfect. <laughs> we'll dive into it. All right, so um, someone wants to know, so they say abiotic and bi biotic stresses responses are intertwined. We know that well, right? So by changing one, you might affect the other. So how do the treatments like silicon and seaweed affect plant responses to pests and pathogens? Yes, so, so I know the most about silicon, um, but, but it's absolutely a very good point if, if um, if you build a strong, resilient plant, it can both help withstand abiotic disorders as well as pest and disease disorders. Um, silicon is this very interesting thing where they found um, cases, and it's not like every plant and every like insect or disease, but there's many cases where um, giving the plant a sufficient supply of silicon also helps with insect and disease resistance too. Um, and the insect side of that piece is quite interesting. Um, some plants are silicon accumulators. So like chrysanthemum, for example, um, will be like 1% by dry weight will be silicon. Um, and it actually deposits that silicon in kind of this, this glassy layer um, 
on the on the outside of the leaves. Um, and so there's been like experiments with leaf miner in chrysanthemum where um, that leaf miner larvae needs to chew through the leaf um, and get its nutrition and then it and then it lays lots of eggs eventually. So they found that just physically that glassy layer from silicon actually like wears down the mandible, it wears down the jaws of chrysanthemum leaf miner um, and makes it, um, it can't gain the nutrition that it needs to reproduce. So it, so it doesn't perform as well. Um, then there are other cases where plants like say petunias are not high accumulators of silicon overall compared to chrysanthemums. Um, they maybe accumulate 10 times less silicon. Um, but they found there might be like these defense response signaling that still explains some of the like insect or disease benefits that you have. Um, so, so yeah, I abs absolutely like those, those things are connected um, in general, the things that we can do, whether they be silicon or seaweed extract or just like our own cultural management practices to fertilize, but not over fertilize and give our plants as much light and not too high of temperatures. Anything that we can do to build a stronger plant is going to help with all of those aspects. Right. Yeah, that's that's really interesting about the leaf miner. I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, yes. I thought that would be a fun example. That's so cool. So um, just staying on the topic of the silicon, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, applying nutrients at the right time and toning. Um, did you happen to look at when applying the silicon provides the most benefit? Is it sort of weekly through the crop or is it during that toning period at the end? Um, what's the best for keeping your plants uh, stress resistant? Great. Yeah, lovely question. I don't necessarily have all the answers to that one. Um, so um, we found that you, in, in terms of when you're trying to see a stress response, you kind of need to continuously supply silicon or so like we couldn't have applied it just once like 10 weeks before and then hope to have carryover effects at the time of, of post harvest. Um, so, so unfortunately in our experiments we've just studied like a, applying it every week at a minimum sometimes like constant liquid feed, um, but I'd like to see more research out there where we look at if we're targeting uh, post harvest shelf life, could we apply it just in the last like two to four weeks of production or during that toning stage and have carryover effects. Um, so from that end, I have to say like to be continued. Yeah, that would be uh, really interesting research for us to see and I think really interesting to a lot of our growers. Um, we talk about doing your own on farm trials a lot when you're trying to add something like this to your program. So, and I noticed you mentioned that here as well. So, um, if anybody's interested in adding silicon to their program, we'd suggest that, yeah, you trial it out on your own farm on a small batch before you sort of go gung ho. But yeah, we'd be really interested in that timing application research as well. So, hopefully, that comes along. Um, exactly. And folks like ourselves can help you think through how to test something at a small scale. Yeah, so like I'll talk with growers sometimes that are like, oh, we tried this and it worked. Um, and I'm like, well, what are your control plants or how do you know it worked? And they're like, well, we didn't have a control, but we, we think they perform better than they did last year. <laughs> it, it's hard without a control to sort of know what's going on. So um, interested in knowing, has anyone looked at using silicon for cut flower post harvest? So there has been some work, um, the, the largest share that I'm aware of is from Oklahoma State University, um, and they looked at sunflowers and zinnias, um, both, so, so plants in the Asteraceae, the, the, the aster family, like chrysanthemums as well, they're, they're all silicon accumulators, um, and they do get um, kind of thicker stems, more rigid stems that, that hold up better um, in the in the post harvest for cut flowers. The other interesting thing they saw was um, so we think of like um, for zinnia, for example, powdery mildew is often a, a pest that we have. So they found like benefits for powdery mildew resistance with with um, increased silicon application. Cool. Yeah, very interesting. Um, some of the other questions we have are sort of more focused on the economic standpoint of a few things you mentioned. So you sure. talked a little bit about 
you know, lighting petunias at the liner stage. And that was interesting. We've done some work with uh, lighting in the propagative stage of different crops here in Ontario. Um, but I wanted to know what, what's your thoughts on the economics of that? So uh, electricity is pretty expensive in Ontario. Um, yes, and yes. We don't always get that early season light that we need to get that DLI to produce that optimal crop. Where's the line in your mind about where it's economically um, beneficial to use supplemental lighting? So, um, so in general for liners, um, and it, it, it is some like somewhat species specific, but, but 10 moles per meter squared per day really seems to be kind of that threshold for good quality. Um, and uh, uh, folks at Michigan State University like Roberto Lopez have done some really nice work with um, propagation of liners at different at different um, moles of light, and so, for example, at uh, two moles or five moles or six moles, um, the the products take a lot longer to reach kind of their full rooting stage. So then they're on your bench for like six weeks instead of three weeks, um, and um, and then overall quality is better with higher light as well. So. Um, so I guess it, you know, it depends on your particular circumstance. Do you, are you paying to heat a greenhouse anyways? And, and like, do you have extra space? So like maybe for you, there's not as much of a detriment of the crop taking five or six weeks to, to root instead of two or three weeks to root. Um, however, if, if space is at a premium for you, you're, you're propagating lots of things and you'd like to get them turned over so you could get the next thing in. Um, and maybe it saves you from having to heat a space for a few extra weeks if you could have a, a quicker turn on your propagation. Um, then I think that favors the economics toward you know supplemental lighting to at least reach the the ten mole minimum. Right. Yeah. Um, it's definitely comes down to your individual business and what your your goals are. So, thanks, Neil. Um, you talked a little bit about. Uh, hardening off with cooler night temperatures. And um, sometimes spring weather in Ontario is a bit difficult to anticipate. The last couple of years, we've had pretty cloudy, gray, wet springs where we've really had to heat a lot uh, to make sure that uh, plants stay on track. But we also have not, uh, uh, it's not unheard of to see, you know, hot, uh, and humid conditions as well. So um, what are your tips on trying to keep the conditions right for toning when the weather is not cooperating? Yes, that's that was a tough one, right? Um, and so looking at the extended weather forecast is certainly a big tool. And I'm sure all of all of the growers are doing that. So if if we're trying to decide to cut back on watering or whether I want to water today, if I'm looking ahead and seeing that's going to be cloudy for the next several days, that would lean me toward growing on the dry side at that, that particular point. So um, doing the things that are under your control. Um, of course, when it is um, when temperatures are warm, um, things get difficult. We could we could lower our nighttime temperature set point so that our average daily temperature um, is still uh, cooler. Um, then we have to be careful sometimes of increased plant stretch. So, so we look at the difference between the day temperature and the night temperature, and we call that diff. Um, and if you have a large positive diff, um, some, some of our spring crops respond by stretching more under that high differential between day temperature and night temperature. So we could like overall slow the plant down, but maybe we also need to consider like plant growth regulators in that point in time so that they're not stretching excessively. Great, great. Um, another one on the heating side. So um, some growers we know have different zones in their greenhouse where they can sort of control that temperature a little more finely. So they might have areas where they're moving plants to tone um, and they can keep different environments a little bit more separate. Um, but if you're trying to work towards that negative diff and you're uh, dropping the temperature and then raising it again in the in the morning to get that differential, how does the economics come into that too? Like, is it um, is it going to cost you more to sort of do that, and is that worth it in the long term, or is that again like a business <laughs> decision? 
Right, right. That becomes a complex economic decision. Yeah. Um, but if it but if it gives you a high quality saleable crop, it might be worth, um, uh, yeah, like like wasting some heat to cool down the greenhouse when you want to, and then reheating the greenhouse when you need to. Like that might be a fair trade off to get the the crop quality that you need. Those those numbers you showed at the beginning about ten uh, percent shrink and twenty percent shrink it adds up quickly. So yeah, it might be worth it. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, we say like we don't want to be uh, penny wise and pound foolish. So a little bit of heat or a little bit of fertilizer might bring you a lot of returns in terms of reducing crop shrink. Perfect. Yeah. Does anybody have any last minute questions for Neil? I don't see any more in the Q and A. Um, yeah. So Neil, we'd just like to say thank you very much again for joining us today. A fantastic webinar. We know it's uh, an important topic for our growers with spring right around the corner. That's right. Good luck, everyone, this winter and this spring. We'll hope to see you on the other side. Yeah, thanks so much, Neil. Bye now.